Polly Swag. Yo, miss, this English stuff is bull crap. What the hell does this article, You Change Culture with Culture, got to do with me? So what if we're a minority? We stamp our authority by hiding our uniform under our footlocker and JJ's hoodies. Play rugby by the cafeteria amidst the lunch rush hysteria. Tuck non-regulation socks into our warehouse canvas shoes. Make island time a synonym for late. Miss, you got a pen? I don't got a room next to my Gala and my Gilbert. Nouns are adjectives and verbs. Acronyms the norm and phonetic spelling takes on a whole new meaning in our FB lingo. Like for a like, I heart you, S-M-H-O-M-G-G. If you look so H-A-A-A-W-T hot, girl, you be straight working it like a boss. Literacy, like actual numeracy. That's like my parents talking about a democracy. We don't respect our peers, don't use our ears, talk back, talk smack, check your Instagram app, like flash hair, latest bands and a new era cap. Got an Adidas bag with a big lunch and no school books. Chest out, shoulders back, rub up holy swag, looks, cause man toko, we straight skucks. Right. Pins down, eyes this way, Chris. Quiet in the back there. I see you, all that you are and can be. Yes, you may be a minority, but you embrace the essence of your identity. You, Faithful Leo Ofo, I got way your mark. What crisp white shirt, not a speck of dirt, dignified length skirt, and with pride, put on your school jersey. School socks cover feet that walk the walk of your gospel mentality. Your yes means yes, and island time is defined as punctuality. You give honor where honor is due. From God to the past, to the Makaya, to your father and your mother. You respect yourself, brown brother, and extend that to one another. For one day you'll be in the Ikaletahi, the Kiwis, the All Blacks, or the Manu's Hall of Fame. But like Eliota and Paul Williams, have the BCOM LLB Bachelor of Business letters next to your name, because you, Turn up to class, or Kualaya Oi lights up your class, living and driven by your purpose and vision to fulfill the commission and excel in your class. Quote Socrates, soliloquies, coding, and philosophies. Lay it down like Tusiata Taylor, Mila Marsh, Maya Angelou. Phenomenal woman, to thy salote self be true. You are a society stamper, a history maker, a planet shaker, chest out, shoulders back, and your head held high. Humility, as loud and as proud as the that you cry. Sunga, Sole, live out the divine purpose for which you were created. That's true. Polly swag. Kokera could educated. Kia ora. Tēnā rā koutou katoa, ngā mahi nui, kia koutou i tēnei rā. Ko aura ki te maunga e runei taku ngā kou. Ko waitaki te awa e mahia nei aku maharahara. No amuru no Otatahi Aho, Emahiana Kinga Tohu or Nehe or Tamaki Makoda, and Noho Neo. No Raira, Tenara Koto Katoa. As part of my Mahi to you today, I also want to acknowledge part of my upbringing. I grew up in a really large, rambling old house, and there was almost always other people living with us who needed a place to stay. For example, there was Luca, he was an avid fisherman. And when he wasn't out and about, he would sit with a cup of tea and actually a pot of tea. He was a, a recovering drug addict and he actually had significant gang connections. There was Nolene. She lived with us um, for a number of years, actually. Every day she would get on her cycle and she would bike to the IHC, which was a really safe place for her. And she would do her arts and crafts. When she come home, I always remember that she sat on the couch with her knitting and she was um, just obsessed with her knitting. Nolene was autistic. She had actually quite significant mental health issues. And it was these and, other, um, and others who stayed with us that actually profoundly shaped my understanding of what it means to be in the world with people different to ourselves. And all of us have backpacks. Like um, in this image here, you can see uh, an image of a backpack on this slide. This slide comes from Open Spaces for Dialogue and Education. And that 
as my experience and how it shaped me and, um, and thinking about cultural um, and cultural reality. And in the backpack, um, yeah. Oh, hang on, I just need to stop. Sorry. <laughs> and that and that backpack. So what happens is that our backpack shapes the way we view our world. So then we have lenses and that's how we view our world. So one person sees a rabbit, another person sees a duck, for example, you can see on that slide. So developing cultural capability requires that we have um, that we are open to having our own beliefs questioned. And many of you here today um, have been engaged in this area of leading for cultural capability and you understand the need to have our own beliefs questioned. And it's something that I'm going to pick up on as being really significant and important as leaders in this field. I also acknowledge that this is a really difficult and emotional topic for many people as cultural capability. Leaders, I think it requires a ton of grace for other people as we journey together. And I want to focus on today on this question, which I believe is at the heart of cultural capability. It is what does it mean to be in ethical relationship with people who are radically different to ourselves? Of course, there are other aspects to cultural capability, but for real change to happen, I think this is the most difficult work. But before I get to this question, I want to place it in a big picture context. So firstly, I'm, I'm going to share a systems change perspective. And secondly, I'm going to map that systems change onto um, the Ministry of Education definition of cultural capability. Because a system change approach helps us to gain a big picture view of where this key question um, fits, as you can see in the next slide. So here we see a, a model of systems change that has six conditions and it defines a system as a bounded space. For example, a school is a system and there's six different conditions at three different levels. For example, at the structural level, you can see there's policy, practice and resource allocation or resource flow. So where there is any persistent, seemingly immovable system held in place, we call this a systems change problem. And so systems change is defined as shifting the conditions which hold a problem in place. So we often focus on one small area without recognizing that other areas need to shift too. Or where we have recognition, we kind of get stuck on how do we create change in this area? So what we can do is we can map the four um, Ministry of Education areas of cultural capability across any of these six area, um, areas of the conditions of systems change. So the four ministry um, areas of concern are Treaty of Waitangi and Principles, Kaupapa Māori, Critical Consciousness and Inclusion. So for example, if we took the treaty principles, we could ask, to what extent are the treaty principles represented in policy? How are they lived out in practice? And what are the resource implications of that? And at the next relational level, we can ask, what are the power dynamics that exist that enable or block principles? And finally, and also like, what are the relationships and connections that we need to enable more um, of this kaupapa to emerge? And finally, at the bottom, when we think about systems change, there's also something really important to us. It's the mental models, and that's the beliefs of people in that system. So if we were thinking about the beliefs of our staff and community, what are their beliefs around treaty principles? What are their understandings? And how can we mobilize shifts and changes in that area? And so we could take a school, for example, and, and map all of these different layers of cultural capability to try and understand where are the points that we want to see shifts happen in, in principles and, kaupapa, and treaty principles and kaupapa Māori and critical consciousness and, and inclusion. And um, so the idea is that because we could make structural level changes probably quite easily, like for example, with policy um, and resource flow even, but we might not see the problem shift if we haven't attended to the mental models, which is the beliefs of the staff, for example. So Daisy and I are really most interested in shifting the mental models because we believe this is where, where real change can emerge, but also where real change can be blocked. And it begins by this idea from um, 
from the ministry about raising critical consciousness, which is vital for this mahi. And I'm really pleased to see this coming out as something to be explored. So I return to this mental models beliefs question because that's what I wanna focus on today. Um, what does it mean to be in an ethical relationship with people who are different to ourselves? So in this next slide, relating to others, we see there are four different perspectives, exclusion, inclusion, celebration, and transformation. So this image here is a provocation really. I acknowledge that it's incomplete and problematic. There's no necessarily right or wrong within it, but I wanna offer it up as a kind of conversation disruptor to invite us to think more critically about how people in our communities or our schools or ourselves, how we relate to others. Um, and by others, I mean those who are different to ourselves. Sociologists actually use the term strangers. Who are these strangers and how do we relate to them? As leaders of cultural capability, I think it's just really helpful to understand the philosophical underpinnings of each one of these different mental models. And there will be others, but um, I just put these these four up as, as something to which we can really speak to. So I'm just gonna talk through each one. The first one is, it says it's about exclusion. Exclusion says you are different to us and you are not welcome here. For example, school students, like if we have someone that, um, that we're struggling with teaching, really struggling with teaching, we, we might be inclined to say, that student has got a problem. It's not my teaching or, you know, it's not the school system. It's not the school culture. The student is just not a good fit for this culture. And um, exclusion says it's really about a fear or a demonization of the stranger. Like we exclude those who are not like us. In schools, we alienate young people who do not fit in, who are not like us. Like, why is it that 66% of all young people are um, excluded from mainstream and attending alternative education are Māori? Another 12% are Pacific. Like, um, what is happening there about our culture of exclusion? So Bowman, the sociologist, actually uses this really provocative term to describe this. He's, he calls it anthropoemic, and it means to vomit out the other or vomit out the stranger. And we can see examples of this all over the world that happen. Exclusion is also sometimes a response to a real or perceived threat. Like we exclude those who do not, um, who we don't, who we believe might cause us harm. So inclusion, inclusion says, Okay, uh, I'm just going to present this idea of inclusion as something also a little bit provocative because I just want us to think a little bit more critically about these concepts. So inclusion, um, some people argue, says, you are welcome here so long as you become like us. Inclusion says we are all the same. Bowman calls this anthropophagic. It means devouring or eating the other and the stranger. And... What happens in an inclusive setting, one could argue, is that we adapt existing systems to accommodate for people who are different to ourselves. But in a way, it's almost a form of assimilation because what we're saying is we have, we have it right. We have the answer, the system works. We just need to adapt things a little bit so that others can fit in and become more like us. So celebration, on the other hand, is a celebration of our differences. It says, you be you and I'll be me. And in schools, we might see this when different cultures come together for festivals, for example. Like we celebrate diversity, we tolerate difference. We hear these words all the time. So what do they really mean and, and, and what does it mean for our schools? Um, the motivation is usually a belief in the rights of others and the right to express your own culture. And this perspective comes from a critical social justice framework. It's focused on raising awareness of critical social justice issues and advocating for change. So we hear all these different voices and all these different um, thoughts spoken out in, in our context where we work. <clears throat> 
But what I want to do is just present to you a, a fourth less thought about idea, which is this idea about transformation. Transformation says, I see you have something to teach me about what it means to be in the world. The difference between celebration and transformation is really about the way that the majority culture is altered in some way by their encounter with the other. Like for example, whereas in celebration, we can learn a new language, we can enjoy different festivals and foods, but our core beliefs actually are not really altered. Transformation is the idea that the other has something to teach us about what it means to be in the world. So we're open to the possibility with vulnerability and with humility and with a belief that our knowledge is partial and in some way actually broken. And it's thinking back to that slide of the question marks that our knowledge is partial and it can be questioned. Like take, for example, macro global things. Let's face it, we're in trouble. We've got climate change, food insecurity, fragile economies, um, late capitalism and collapse. We've got the social dilemma. We have unprecedented mental health issues, especially for our young people. And they all point to the need for a significant transformation. A transformation perspective is a recognition of this need and a genuine openness to being taught by the other. Transformation is disruptive to our stable sense of self because it brings into question what our core beliefs are. It comes often through an awkwardness and a whole raft of other emotions, vulnerability, and also through humility. So I think that developing cultural capability requires that we are, that we are open to have our own beliefs questioned. And so as cultural capability leaders, we go gently recognizing this and seeking to open spaces for real dialogue to come to take place, open spaces for safe dialogue to come to come to place. So I have a whole entire practice around this, around critical consciousness and around shifting mental modes. And it's really difficult work. Obviously today we don't have time to unpack this, but we can begin to ask questions. What I've hoped to do is offer these viewpoints as a way to recognize in ourselves and others, what are the mental modes and what are the beliefs that are operating that exist that can hold a system in place or that can bring about change. Ko Ngati Hamo, me Ngati Chinese te iwi, no South Auckland a hau ko Daisy Toku Ingoa. Fa talofa tu pa ia ma ma malu a fia le nei aoli talofa 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 lava. Um, welcome everyone and thank you for being so generous and um, can I have a snap in the room? How awesome was Dr. Judy Bruce just then? Mm -hmm. um, and trust that you had an awesome breakout session. Hey, I'm going to share just for the next nine and a half minutes um, some stories about my family, navigating the system, some youth voice and then close with celebrating some of the things that you'll already be doing in your schools before posing some questions for the breakout room. And I might preface that although a lot of my examples will be about Pacific, um, that some of these actually can be um, applied or thought, be thought about with marginalized communities. So a little bit about my whanau. Uh, Chris, if you could please pop that photo up. So my husband, um, Sita, is a creative and he's an educator. Uh, we have three girls. That's come up yet. It's just coming, just coming. Yeah, and just a moment. Legend, thank you. Um, and so Hadassah, she's in the middle, she's 12. She goes to a school in the east of Christchurch for those who aren't from Ototahi, um, called Hayata Community Campus. I think I saw Sue in the room, welcome Fire Sue. Um, and Hadassah is a creative. So right now she's learning about 360 Fusion software to work, work a CNC router. And when she grows up, she wants to be a traditional Samoan tattooist. Me, on the other hand, still trying to figure out what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> um, Michael A on the left, she's 10. She goes to Hillview Christian School. And she's pretty set on what she wants to be when she grows up. She wants to be a, a full-time rugby player like Ruby Tui and a part-time rapper and a part-time anthropologist. Go figure. 
And um, Anna on the right hand side, she attends an urban school, which is four stories high in the middle of Christchurch. And they don't have a library, a pool, a field um, or a gym, because for them, all of those, the city is their backyard. And just uh, last week, um, Anna goes to my mum, Nana, I seen that you got no, um, no toys in your children's church, but don't worry, Nana, I've solved that for you. Here are my TYs, my Marvel toys, and my Matchbox cars. How much do you want to pay for them, Nana? <laughs> got the uh, entrepreneur in our family, but she, she reckons when she grows up, she wants to be an engineer and quote, boss as chick, unquote. And I, I always share this when I'm, if I'm sharing poetry in different spaces with rangatahi, because I feel like it's important to acknowledge that all of us come with different skills, strengths, talents, um, and things that we want to be. And for me as a parent, although they're like in primary school and they go to three different primary schools, for my husband and I, it's really important that they're in places where they'll flourish um, and that they'll be we know that they will grow up into being young women who will walk into the fullness of their calling and most importantly, be happy. If I can have the next slide. Thank you, Chris. And so I'm going to share very briefly about what it was like for me and my mihi. You heard that I was uh, born and raised uh, in the beautiful island of Mangere, South Auckland. And um, I'm going to share a short poem called Tupperware which tells you a little bit about what it was like growing up in South Auckland and then speak to this photo, which is at my high school, Epsom Girls Grammar. Tupperware. The 10 kg margarine tub from Pack and Save stretches on for miles out here, irrigated with tears, fears, blood and sweat. I never knew what real butter tasted like. The 5 kg margarine tub from Pack and Save, our smaller sized Tupperware. I never knew why my dad used to wait till we finished eating or why he'd only pour my glass of milk only half full or why my high school mates, they didn't even know what a white bread and tomato sauce sandwich was. I'd never tell them that I knew the ratio of boiling water to tap water needed to fill the 10 kg margarine tub from Pack and Save so I could shower or that chicken for us were boxes of diabetes inducing buck or more turkey tails or that my siblings and I, we used to cut up the bread crust and serve it on the local paper and imagine it was a dollar half scoop from Wickman Way. I remember <laughs> my high school friend on the bus, she with her Nike bandana, her Ray-Ban sunglasses and her free stripes of Adidas's, yep. She was a mean ass label basher, eh? She was flashing, flashing the butter chicken her mum made from scratch. She was licking, licking the white coconut cream center. She went to throw away the brown biscuits. Me and my mate, we jumped up to grab them because we couldn't bear to see food wasted, eh? And when I jumped off my bus in Mangere, South Auckland, I seen all my intermediate schoolmates up to us. Wah, wah, mate. Chee-hee-hee. Sabos. All the girls were pregnant. All the drugs were hard, or their partners filled the prison cells. Their eyes empty, speckled like freckles in the Moana drowning, like the Tupperware in our cupboards. Kia ora. And um, in the particular church that I went to, and only my church, not every Pacific church is like this, can I say that? Um, it was customary that um, at the end of Form 5, you can hear my age there, you would have to leave school and go work in a factory. And um, my mum decided to draw a line in the sand and say that I was going to finish Year 13 at Epsom Girls Grammar. And not only that, but go on to study university. And for my sister, she would take that scholarship to university in the States, thank you very much. And um, although seemingly small, that gesture profoundly revolutionary for my siblings and I. And it came at a great personal cost for my mum. She lost friends, she lost her social circles. A lot was my father's family and we attended church at least six times a week. So a great personal cost for her. Navigating school was another challenge. Um, there were only maybe 10 Māori and Pacific girls in our cohort of 450 girls, but we had each other. We had a couple of key staff, 
big mihi to Mrs. Bendel and Mrs. Rennie who had our backs and we had uncles who came in and taught Polyfest. And when we walked out of the Shakespeare classes in English, we could don our headphones and listen to the hip hop of the likes of Biggie Smalls who reflected our lived experiences. Lyrics like, you used to fuss when the landlords dissed us. No heat, wonder why Christmas missed us. Birthdays was the worst days. Now we sip in champagne when we thirsty. So this photo here, last year, my childhood friend, Dr. Karamia Muller, the first Samoan woman in the world with a PhD in architecture, were blessed to go back and speak to our Pacific cohort of Epsom Girls Grammar School students. And man, Kara and I were so amazed. You could see in their libraries, they had um, Selena Tusitala Marsh, Carlo Mila, Tusiata Avia, Grace Taylor, and Pacific Films adorning their screens. Whereas we thought back to when we were at high school and how we couldn't see ourselves reflected in the highest echelons of society. And our question for ourselves was, has the needle moved in the 20 years since leaving high school? Last week, I judged a youth poetry slam competition. It was the semifinals. And the head girl from Aurere College said this piece. Um, and if that could be brought up, please, Chris. And I'll quickly read it. On her poem. And you might have known her. She came on Campbell Life. Our Desau School to School open today. Spent it watching people swap levers, notice for CVs. Because money is low and mouths got to eat. It's ironic. When level three came, watched my friends bury their youth in every graveyard shift. Day after day, they were told they were essential, but those Chromebooks never came. So I guess they were at the bottom of the waiting list. It's ironic how people say South Auckland broke the lockdown rules the most when we asked to unarm the police as if walking outside my house is reason enough to be shot in the street. It's ironic how we didn't break the rules. Our mobility rates are so high because while you work from home on Zoom, we have the most essential workers packing your shopping, driving the buses, cleaning your classroom. I'm reminded there are things only the streets can teach you. If education is key, why do our locks keep changing? If knowledge is power, why does it come at a price we cannot afford? Every problem of society taught in class can be found in the hood. Don't need a degree for empathy. And um, that really rocked me, eh? Just thinking 20 years ago, has the needle really moved? Um, and my final PowerPoint, thanks, Chris. Coming back to Dr. Judy's um, um, like systems change diagram. I've just got some pictures here, which I think will give time to break out and talk about very quickly. But at the top, thinking about some things that we might already do in our schools, top tiers, like a Pacific strategy, um, our practice as teachers resourcing. Do we have deans? Do we have, um, what kind of literature do we have in our schools? The middle tier, things like Polyfest, Pacifica deans. And I guess the bottom tier in closing, this is my friend and young person, um, Okidano Tilea. And I'd like to close, close on this quote that Peter Senge says, mental models are the deeply held internal images of how the world works, images that limit us to familiar ways of thinking and acting. Very often we are not consciously aware of our mental models or the, way, or the effects they have on our behavior. And this young man at the bottom, man, he's super smart, super athletic. He's like a super Samoan. Uh, serves in his local faith, place of faith. And I'm always honored that I have so much to learn from him and hope too that maybe there are some offerings of knowledge that I too can share with him.